Let's go through quickly, trying to be like fast today and get through all these games. There's so many good football games to talk about, but the Division II football scene, man. This week, it was incredible. It certainly did not disappoint. Let's start with, I mean, the premier game in all of D2 this last week. Our game of the week selection. Harding goes into Wachita Baptist, and they get beat. The number one team in the country taken down by number nine, Wachita, 17-13. to I got to watch the whole second half of this one, at least. The environment was incredible. You got the Philly special, or the Tiger special, as they're calling it down there. A big-time touchdown. Harding at the very end of the game. Obviously, that flex bone offense built to sustain long drives. They go in and have to, you know, go down the entire length of the field in one minute. Had some very uncharacteristically not thought-out plays. You see here, this is the last play from our friend Cole Keelan. That one a little bit long. The incompletion would seal the deal for the Bisons, and uh, what a statement win for this Washita team, and I think a lot of people counted them out, not in the way that, you know, they're a top 10 ranked team in the country. They weren't counted out of the whole spiel, but a lot of people counted them out in that they didn't think they could win this game. They didn't think the Tigers could host the number one team in the country and, and take them down on their own field. That's something that I don't think people were really expecting, and the plays from the offense were great for this Watchtaw team. The defense from this Tiger squad were playing out of their mind. You had some great individual performances defensively. Guys like, uh, you look here, Dawson Miller, 16 tackles in the day and a fumble recovery. How about uh, uh, Jarelin Burks, 12 tackles, a TFL. You look down the list, there's a lot of other great individual performances. But as a team, as a group, I think what really stood out to me, that front seven for Watchtaw, their ability to maintain kind of a, a really just hold Harding. Like you, you held Harding down and did not let them eat up that clock and hold the time possession, generated a couple, you know, those big time stops, those turnovers. And I, what it, that boils down to for me, you have two teams that are incredibly familiar with each other. And that's different than Harding going and playing Pittsburgh State or GVSU in the playoffs, right? Or Central Missouri. These are two teams that go at it every single year. This is a Watchtaw defensive staff and defensive group that knows exactly what to expect from this Harding squad. It's probably been game planning for that multiple years. This is a, a game and a kind of a budding rivalry, although Watchtaw and Henderson obviously have the kind of the battle down there. But um, this is a game and budding rivalry where these teams know exactly what to expect from each other. And I think that was the, the key point for this Watchtaw team. They knew exactly what they were getting into, and defensively, they stepped up to the task. It was an incredible performance uh, from a team that certainly deserved that big-time win, and uh, I do have to shout out the guys on the broadcast, too. It was one of the best, uh, most fun games to listen to. That environment, second to none down there in Arkadelphia. Almost 6,000 watching the game live on YouTube with me. That is crazy. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, yeah, another cliff note for Harding. You look at their offense. Certainly not built for the late game heroics. Harding does not have a two minute drill kind of built into that that scheme down there. They made some boneheaded mistakes in that final drive, which is uncharacteristic of them. And you know, I'm not saying change your game plan and just you know, abandon the flex bone after one loss after 26 in your 26th game. You won the last 25. But what I am saying is, you know, if you're Harding, there's going to be some other really good teams down the line. You're going to be playing in the postseason if you're Harding for sure. And there's probably going to be another moment that. Harding needs to have some late game heroics where there's, you know, less than two minutes on the clock. So now this might be a really great learning experience for this Bison's team up there in Searcy that they can go and game plan and have some things prepared for that moment that you're not scrapping and totally twitching up the offense or, you know, throwing away all this foundation you have, but adding a wrinkle or two, you know, to a fact where you could actually make something happen in these points because their offense just certainly did not get it done. They're running, running a one-man route with – you know, 40 seconds left in the game. And if Braden Jay, who is obviously a great playmaker, you could put anyone out there. They're not going into quadruple coverage and pulling down a ball. So it could be a great learning moment for this Harding team. But let's move forward. Another top 25 matchup. Number 13, Charleston. They go into number 22, Frostburg State, and absolutely have their way with them. Uh, Siobhan Wright, he now leads the country across all levels in total rushing yards. 1,296. That's uh, just under 200 a game. For you mathematicians. Charleston 7-0 and for the first time since 2009. That feels pretty awesome. Charleston in this one, they got out. I mean, this game was 48 to nothing at one point. Frostburg didn't even score until 2 minutes and 20 seconds left in the fourth quarter. This was a dominant performance. Wright scores 5 touchdowns in this one. He scored the first 3 uh, in the first half. And this team was absolutely rolling. This Charleston squad... 
there is a lot of really good things going for them right now to highlight some other individual performances. Neither team did too much through the air. It was obviously a ground and pound type of game for the Charleston squad. Uh, Maquan Heron, though, four mm-hmm. catches, 78 yards. Feels like a pretty good stat line for him. And then defensively for Charleston, you had... Uh, Two fumble recoveries on the day that were pretty big-time moments. You had an interception through the air uh, to Kavis Preston. A couple guys showing up big-time, like Nesta Owens with two sacks. Kashawn Beasley got into the backfield, and those guys forced a fumble as well. And uh, really an all-three-phases type of win for this Charleston squad, and people are taking them very seriously now. I don't know if they were at the start of the season. They are, I tell you what, they're taking them very seriously now, and they've got a really good chance to shake things up over in that super region. But speaking of a shakeup, this might be the best example of that. We've talked a lot about this Slippery Rock team, and you know what? I think Chuck Bittner, uh, watching D2Football.com, inside D2, D2 Football, excuse me, this week, he made some really good points about how this Slippery Rock team is winning games, albeit winning them a little bit differently. They haven't been doing it, um, one, the same level of kind of dominance when it comes to offensively, but they also have been doing it in kind of different ways in that they're controlling the time of possession and, and kind of grinding out these kind of games is not winning these games on explosive plays. Well, Eventually, when you switch things up like that, it might come back to bite you. This week, it did. California, PA, they pick up a massive win on their homecoming over what was then the number six team in the country in Slippery Rock. You see it here. It starts off early. They air this thing out all the way down the field. That was uh, a statement start to this one. That was uh, Eric Willis from uh, Davis Black, 65 yards. That was 10 seconds on the time possession to open things up and get this thing going. That would turn into 14-0 here. Eric McCann, 14 yards into the end zone. The Vulcans had things going. Even more here, another field goal would make it 17-0. I mean, we're still in the first half. Slippery Rock does go ahead and answer with a uh, touchdown pass. Kylan Wilson catches one from Braden Long. But... uh, Two more scores in the second half from Cal, and this thing kind of got out of hand. 28-7, to the final here. The Vulcans looked, I mean, really, really solid in this one at uh, in Adamson Stadium. But you look through here, Brayden Long's still going to go get his. 24 for 38, 282, and a touchdown. Did have one interception through the air. Cal, though, Davis Black put on quite the performance. 16 for 26, 250, and a tud through the air. Certainly helps. The Rock rushing attack was almost completely nullified in this one. Idris Lawrence, five carries for 33 yards. That's an All-American-type caliber back coming over from Notre Dame College. He was pretty much snuffed on the day. Uh, Chris Dior, Braden Long also had a couple rushes that did not go anywhere. So that Cal rushing defense really got things done. Eric Willis, we saw his big-time touchdown. Five catches, 106 yards for him, and a touchdown through the air. So a big-time win for this Cal squad. And I'll have to look and see here. We look at their schedule. For California, they're 6-1 and one right now. They're one loss, a four-point loss to that Charleston team we just talked about. You already pick up some statement wins over teams like Westchester and Lock Haven on the road. You win at Seton Hill last week. Their margin of victory in most of these games is less than one score, but they are winning these games against quality opponents, and they just had their best performance yet against the best competition they'll play all year. Now... Going into this weekend on the 26th here, the 15th Cole Bowl against IUP that is at home. They actually finished their last three games at home. So now you're looking at a Cal team that they take care of business this weekend. This could be a a one-loss Cal team going into the playoffs that is really going to shake some things up. So excited to see what they will continue to do moving on into the rest of the year. Let's talk about maybe a little bit of another surprise. This time, though, over in the GMAC, Kentucky Wesleyan picks up what I feel like is a really statement win for that program. They travel up to Midland, Michigan to take on the Timberwolves from Northwood and come out of it with a win, 27-20. to And uh, this one, we'll go through the highlights. The the big play at the end here, Brandon Mackey scores the game-winning touchdown with five seconds left for the Panthers. But, uh, you know, Kentucky Wesleyan was 1-4. Heading into Saturday, Northwood four and two, seemingly making the turn under Coach Buer there, and uh, had a big win over Saginaw early in the year. Still some growing pains, evidently, for this Timberwolf squad. Not to say the season is a failure because they're still doing a lot of really good things, but a tough loss for this Northwood squad. In the first half, things were tied up at thirteen apiece. Heading into halftime, Northwood and uh, Kentucky Wesley would both score 
in the third quarter. And the fourth quarter was almost entirely scoreless until the very end when uh, Mackey puts one in to finish the deal for Kentucky Wesleyan. And you talk about a statement win for Coach Young and company down there at Kentucky Wesleyan. That's a really big time win for those guys. And one that uh, when you're one in four, you start to lose guys, maybe having the buy in, right? Guys start to check out. And it happens at all levels of football, whether you believe it or not. When you're not winning, you're not succeeding, and you're really struggling, you're going to have some guys that check out. This is a win that could revitalize your season, especially in conference play. Maybe they go on here. I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs or go and win a, a regional championship, but what I'm saying is they could go now and win a couple more conference games that they're not supposed to win on paper. So that feels like a really big-time win for that Kentucky Wesleyan squad. But... Let's move over to uh, some Lone Star competition. We haven't talked too much about this conference, I feel like, as of late. A UTPB squad that maybe has disappointed compared to some of the preseason expectations. They take on Western Oregon this week. And uh, this one, incredibly back and forth. Back and forth in the way that UTPB scores the first two touchdowns of this one. They went up 14-0 in the first quarter. You'll see the first score, I do believe, here. There it is. That's Deion Cook from Isaac Mooring. And uh, UTP up, TB, excuse me, up 7 nothing, And they got things rolling, but going into halftime, it was actually a pretty evened-up game. Western Oregon took the lead 20-14 to going into the half. And I'll let you go through some of the some of the clips here, but the uh, the play at the end of the game is what really seals it, and we'll I'll just kind of talk as we go along. That's a touchdown there from Western Oregon. Uh, Kevon Ed from uh, Canada Jones. Field goal there to kind of get things going. This UTPB squad, the offense is starting to find their rhythm, certainly. Kenny Hernser, uh, losing him is obviously a big deal under center. But uh, the overtime kick is what really sealed the deal, and I guess they don't have it on, on this clip. I apologize. But the overtime clip is what really sealed the deal. I have to find... I have to find that clip because it's it'd be too good not to uh, not to show it on here. I'm gonna pull it up real quick. So now in overtime, Keaton Emmett to seal the deal through the uprights. That one's good from 29 yards out. Western Oregon takes this one. A statement win for the Wolves. You see the celebration there at midfield. I mean, what a time to be a fan of this WOU squad. That is, uh, that's a pretty exciting win for that team. And, you know, we haven't talked about them too much on the show, but really excited for them to have that kind of success. And you look at them this year and the schedule as far as 2024, what that holds for them. They're 5-2 and two right now. This Western Oregon squad is 5-2 and two with statement wins now over UTPB, and you've got West Texas A&M a win there. Um, right now, you're undefeated inside of the Lone Star Conference. This is the team that could run the table and win out in the league. Your two losses are at Idaho State and Cal Poly, out-of-division type games. This team is a really, really well-equipped team to go on and make some noise in the postseason, and admittedly one that I did not expect whatsoever. So, really impressive win for those guys. But let's move over to the Gulf South here and talk about uh, another little upset, if you will. Number 10, West Alabama goes into Delta State, and they get beat. 21-6, to the Statesmen take this one. You see them driving here in the first stop, just short of the goal line right there. And uh, this is a big-time win for a Delta State squad that has been a little bit back and forth. The first touchdown coming on the ground right here off the legs of Cole Kirk for the Statesman. There he is, celebrating with his squad. Then uh, West Alabama, they respond, respond Excuse me, right here up the middle. That's Bry Webb with a score for the Tigers there. And this one was all scores in the first half. The second half, the defense has both pitched shutouts, which is worth noting. Now, the extra point there gets blocked and stuffed, which uh, would kind of be inconsequential at the end of the day. But you look at the performances in this one. Cole Kirk certainly had a day through the air. Spencer Arsenal, I'm assuming hopefully pronouncing that one correct, the quarterback for UWA, 61 pass attempts on the day for him. That is ridiculous. Um, also ridiculous, that big-time touchdown for Delta State right there. But a really big-time win for the Statesman squad as they move forward into Gulf South play. 5-2 and two right now, had a loss to Wingate earlier on out of conference, and then they had that tough loss to West Florida, but still a lot of uh, big-time football to be played here. You look at their last three weeks of the year. North Greenville, who's playing some good ball right now, Valdosta State, enough said, and then Mississippi College, 
some tough games to close out the year if you're DSU, but uh, certainly feels like a team that is well-equipped to do that very closely coming off of losing Patrick Shegog and some other pieces of that Statesman offense. Still going to be a lot going on there. Let's close things off with some GLIAC action. The new number one team in the country, that's Grand Valley State University. The Battle of the Valleys this last week versus Saginaw Valley State. Grand Valley comes out on top. Let's roll the tape. Let's talk about it a little bit as we uh, as we get into this. And SVSU, as you'll see here, I don't know if this is the, the highlights are from GVSU, but we'll see if they end up showing it or not. I have to check it out. No, they, they didn't. But um, GVSU on their first offensive snap, a safety from Saginaw Valley would start things off two to nothing. And I think that was kind of the best indicator of where this game was going. You got a couple of big chunk plays from this GVSU offense. Um, but really, the, the name of the game were both defenses playing at an incredible clip. And when you look through this, you know, there's not many turnovers generated. I don't think actually there were any, doesn't look like any fumbles or interceptions or those kind of things, but just some really good defensive performances from both sides. Anthony Cardamone, a big one, 11 tackles, a sack, two TFLs, and a PBU on the day for Grand Valley. But Saginaw Valley, we know that defense has been playing at an incredible clip, led by the likes of guys like Brandon Rawls, Alfred Daly Jr., Micah Kretzinger in that linebacker core, Elijah Gordon. All of these guys' big time plays had one, two, three, four, five, six different guys in the books for sacks on the day for Saginaw Valley and a lot of them registering other points in the stat book but uh, at the end of the day it wasn't enough GVSU comes out on top of this one uh, with a final score of 16 to 9 that might be a weird score Agami it feels like um, into the halftime though Saginaw up 9 to 3 GVSU would score twice in the second half to finish this one off and now you're looking at the number one team in the country right now with the loss to Harding and a team that going into the Anchor Bone weekend, has a lot at stake. Ferris State, Grand Valley State in Allendale this week. That game is going to be absolutely ridiculous. I would love to be there, but uh, it's going to be a really fun one down there in Allendale for uh, for both parties. I mean, obviously, one of them will have to you know, eventually actually win the game, but that could have a lot of playoff and GLIAC implications inside of that. But, whew, close things off here. Some quick hitters for you. Carson Newman, they improved to 7-0 after a win over UVA Wise. How about them Eagles? Roosevelt, they get their first D2 win and first GLIAC win over NMU in OT. Beat the Cats down up here in the Superior Dome. Davenport, they come from behind. Some more GLIAC action to beat Wayne State, 43-26. Then you had number 8, Central Oklahoma, avoiding an upset against Northeastern State. That game was crazy. Northeastern State, the Riverhawks were up big, and UCO comes from behind, and their offense exploded in that second half to bring them back and win that one. UCM, they bounced back. Three losses for a UCM team was not on my bingo card for this year, especially with Zabrowski back under center. But uh, they take down Northwest Missouri State 35-30, a pretty big statement win for the Mules. Probably one of the biggest ones, though, in the MIAA, Pitt State. They come up with some big plays late to overcome Fort Hayes State, a one-point win for uh, what they like to call Lit State over there, which I think is actually uh, totally hilarious. Number seven, Pitt State hosting Fort Hayes State. I got a couple of clips uh, from this one for you guys, too. And, uh, you know, this Fort Hayes, Fort Hayes State team, excuse me, has no slouch, no pushover. But it was the defense for Pitt State that stepped up late. They had a pass deflected and an interception that would lead to the game-scoring touchdown in the fourth quarter. And looking forward for this Pitt State squad, you're playing UCO this weekend. Those are two top five, top ten caliber teams squaring off for what will most likely be the MIAA championship, but will also be a, a bid in Super Region number three. So really excited to see how that one pans out down there. This Pitt State squad has been really uh, fun to follow through this year, and this UCO team with Jet Huff and uh, Terrell Davis and those kind of guys has been really exciting as well. How about that play in the back of the end zone right there? Holy shit. Uh, but a lot of MIAA action that has been really exciting. Outside of the MIAA, Benedict outlasts Allen in overtime 34-27, and then Wheeling with a big-time win, 35-33 over West Virginia State. Woo! 